everything we can to make it happen. We now come to the questions to the Prime Minister, and we are going to start with Martin Doherty Hughes. Martin Doherty Hughes. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and I shall have uh, further such meetings later today. Martin Doherty Hughes. Uh, the journey of Monira Mirza from the pages of the Srebrenica denying living Marxism and the revolutionary Communist Party into the heart of Number 10 has not gone unnoticed, Mr Speaker. On a Monday, the Prime Minister appointed them to lead the, commission, the Government's Commission for Racial Inequality, and it was greeted with some disbelief, given their well-known views on the matter. So I wonder, Mr Speaker, to kind of Prime Minister tell us today, does he agree with Ms Mirza that previous inquiries have fostered a culture of grievance within minority communities? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I am a huge admirer of uh, Dr Munira Manaza, who is a brilliant uh, thinker about these issues, and uh, we are certainly going to proceed with a new cross-governmental uh, commission to look at uh, racism and discrimination, uh, and it will be a very thorough piece of work looking at uh, discrimination in uh, in health, in education, in the criminal justice system. And I know that the House will say we've already had uh, plenty of commissions and, and plenty of work, but it is clear from the Black Lives Matter march and uh, all the representations that we have had that more work needs to be done. And this Government is going to do it. We're now heading up to Yorkshire to visit Andrea Jenkins. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following the disgraceful events of the last week, with thugs defacing national monuments, including Churchill and Queen Victoria, and offending the memory of hero PC Keith Palmer, what will the Prime Minister do to uphold British values and carry out the rule of law? Thank you. Uh, well, well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and as, as I can tell her, I can tell the House any uh, incident of vandalism or attack on public property uh, will be met with the full force of the law and uh, perpetrators will be prosecuted. And I can also confirm that we are looking at new ways in which we may legislate against vandalism of war memorials. We now come to Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by welcoming the announcement of a major breakthrough in the treatment of coronavirus by UK scientists? That's really fantastic news and we're all behind it and I want to pay tribute to all of those involved. Can I also welcome the Prime Minister's latest U-turn, uh, this time on free school meals? That was the right thing to do uh, and it's vital for the 1.3 million children who will benefit. It's just one step in the fight against child poverty. A report last week from the Government's Social Mobility Commission concluded that there are now 600,000 more children living in relative poverty than in 2012. Yeah. The report went on to say child poverty rates are projected to increase to 5.2 million by 2022. What does the Prime Minister think caused that? Well, I, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman for what he's said about uh, dexamethasone, and uh, I'm glad that he's finally paying tribute to the efforts of this country in tackling uh, coronavirus. But I can tell him that on, uh, on, on free school meals, this, this government is very proud that we set up universal uh, free school meals, and I'm very pleased that uh, we are going to be able to uh, deliver a, a, a COVID summer food package to some of the poorest uh, families in this country, and that's exactly uh, the right thing to do. But I must say that I think he's completely wrong in what he says about poverty. Uh, absolute poverty, relative poverty have both declined under this government, and there are, there are hundreds of thousands, I think 400,000 fewer families living in poverty now than there were in 2010. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says poverty has not increased. I've just read a direct quote from a government report, from a government commission produced last week, which says it's gone up by 600,000. The Social Mobility Commission has a clear answer to my question. This anticipated rise in child poverty is, driven, is not driven by forces beyond our control. I gave the Prime Minister the number, 600,000. He didn't reply. The report goes on to say, and this is a real cause for concern, and the Prime Minister's chuntering. You might want to listen. 
real cause for concern because the Commission goes on. I'm sure the Prime Minister's read the report. That it's even. <laughs> they are really concerned that these projections were made, 5.2 million, before the impact of COVID 19. And they go on to say, which we expect to push more families into poverty. This is a serious issue. I'm sure the Prime Minister would agree that an even higher child poverty rate would be an intolerable outcome from this pandemic. So what's he going to do to prevent it? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm sorry, I've just understood what the, the right hon. The right gentleman is talking about, what he calls an anticipated rise, rather than a rise that has actually uh, taken place. I think a, a new concept is being introduced uh, into, our, into our deliberations. Uh, what we're talking about was what has actually happened, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, which is a reduction in, in poverty. And I can tell him that, of course, we are concerned. And, and, and the whole House will understand that, of course, this government is deeply concerned about the impact of coronavirus on uh, the UK economy. But I think everybody, uh, with any fairness, would uh, acknowledge that this government has invested massively in protecting the workforce of this country. 11, 11 million jobs protected by the coronavirus job retention scheme, unlike anything done anywhere else in the world. £30 billion worth of business loans, and we intend to make sure that we minimise the impact of coronavirus on the poorest kids uh, in this country. And one of the best ways in which we could do that, by the way, Mr Speaker, would be to encourage all kids uh, who can go back to school to go back to school now because, because their schools are safe. Last week I asked him whether he would say publicly that schools were safe uh, to go back to. He hummed and he hawed. Now is his time to say it clearly. Schools are safe to go back to. Mr Speaker, your witness. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister obviously hasn't got the first idea what the Social Mobility Report actually said last week, a government body, um, uh, uh, and he talks to me about consistency and U-turns. The government's had three U-turns in the last month. First we had immigration health charges, then we had MPs voting, and then we had free school meals. The only question now is whether U-turns at the dispatch box um, before or after. Three U-turns. He argues about one brief one week and one the next. He's an expert in that. Uh, Mr Speaker, this isn't the only area where the government are falling short. During this pandemic, local authorities have been working flat out on social care, on homelessness, obtaining pre protective equipment for the front line, delivering food and essential supplies. On the 26th of March, the Community Secretary told Council leaders directly and in terms. This was a letter to Council leaders and a speech. The Government stands ready to do whatever is necessary to support councils in their response to coronavirus. Does the Prime Minister believe that the Government has kept that promise? Mr Speaker, we'll put £3.2 billion extra into local government to tackling uh, coronavirus. But I must say, we didn't hear an answer, did we, Mr Speaker? How can, we, how can, we talk, how can he talk about tackling uh, the effect of coronavirus on, on the most disadvantaged? It's the most disadvantaged kids, Mr Speaker, who need to go back to school. And it is, it is that, those groups which, unfortunately, at the moment, are not going back to school. And let's hear it from, from him for one more time. Will he say that schools are safe to go back? back to. Come on. Obama. Mr Speaker, this, this is turning into opposition questions. If the Prime Minister, if, if the Prime Minister wants to swap places, I'm very happy. We could do, could do, could do it now. Mr Speaker, uh, the, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, uh, the only bit of an answer he gave was about £3.2 billion pounds of the question I asked. Uh, well, it's a lot of money. The Conservative-led Conservative local government authority uh, said that they're going to have a shortfall of £10 billion this year. The Health Secretary heckles. The Conservative leader of Lancashire County Council wrote a letter to the Community Secretary a month ago on the 7th of May. And he said this, the overall financial impact on councils nationally and locally will be far in excess of the £3.2 billion provided to date. He went on to say, we would like some assurance from you that all councils will be fully reimbursed for the cost of COVID-19. These are the Prime Minister's own council leaders. He must have known about this problem for months. Why has he been so slow to act? 
Right, we haven't, because in addition to the 3.2 billion, we've already put another 1.6 billion to support councils delivering frontline services, plus another 600 million from my memory to go into into social care. And the reality is, Mr. Speaker, you know, I really want to return to this point about poverty. We want to tackle deprivation in this country. I want kids to go back to school. The unions won't let him say the truth. Which is that schools, a, a great ox has stood upon his tongue, Mr. Speaker. Let him now say that schools are safe to go back to. Question. Prime Minister. <laughs> I spoke. Mr. Speaker, Ms. Mr. Speaker uh, the Prime Minister just doesn't get how critical this is. I spoke with council leaders across the country this week. They face a choice. The Prime Minister must know this between cutting core services or facing bankruptcy under Section 114 notices. Either outcome will harm local communities and mean local services can't reopen. That will drive up poverty, something the Prime Minister says he doesn't intend to do. Local councils have done everything asked of them in this crisis. The Government hasn't. Will the Prime Minister take responsibility and actually do something? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, with great respect to the right honourable gentleman, I have outlined what we are doing to support local government, and I think that this country can be very proud of the investments that we have made. I think, by the way, that they can be very proud of all the incredible work that local government officials have done across this country. Uh, but I must say there are some there are some councils, and particularly Labour councils, alas, that are not uh, opening their schools now when they could be opening their schools. And I say and I say to him uh, now for the I hope the last time, now is the moment when he can say to those Labour councillors that it is safe uh, for kids to go back to reception, uh, to year one, to year six, uh, to early years, as they can. Will he he now say it? Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, every week the the Prime Minister seems to complain that I ask him questions at Prime Minister's questions. If he wants to swap places, so be it. Finally, Mr Speaker, I want to... I want to return to the Prime Minister's uh, other recent U-turn, the immigration health surcharge for NHS and care workers. Following Prime Minister's questions on the 20th of May, the Government announced that it would drop this deeply unfair charge. That's nearly a month ago. Nothing's happened. The BMA, the Royal College of Nursing, the Royal College of Physicians and UNICEF have all written to the Prime Minister. So he must know about this. One doctor was quoted on Monday as saying, my colleagues who have applied, even yesterday, one of them said he had to pay for himself, his wife and his four kids, that's £6,000. He says the Home Office is saying that nothing has been implemented. These are people on the front line. The Prime Minister said he would act. When is he going to do so? I'm I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely grateful for uh, an important question because uh, it is is vital that people who uh, are working on the front line and uh, NHS workers in uh, in particular get the support that they need. And uh, that's why I said uh, what I said a a few weeks ago. And what I can tell him is that uh, NHS or care workers uh, who have paid uh, the, the, the surcharge since uh, the 21st of May will be refunded and we are getting on with instituting the new uh, arrangements as fast as we possibly can. Leonici. Mr Speaker, I welcome the Prime Minister's rejection of the extension to the Brexit transition period. Can I ask him if he agrees with me that taking back control of our fishing waters in January 2021 will benefit the fishing communities within the Great Grimsby constituency? Uh, I can can tell my hon. Friend that it certainly will, and we are going to become once again an independent coastal state. And uh, I know how brilliantly she campaigns for fisheries in Grimsby, and I would urge her to engage uh, with DEFRA to make sure now that the people of Grimsby can uh, exploit the recapture of our spectacular natural marine wealth. Heading to Scotland to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Marcus Rashford has shown more moral leadership in tackling poverty in a matter of days than this Tory government has in the past decade of cuts. But as he says, people are struggling all year round and more needs to be done. 
This morning, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and Save the Children have published research showing the ongoing health crisis is causing six in ten families to borrow money, seven in ten to cut back on essentials, and over five in ten falling behind on rent and other essential bills. Mr Speaker, an extra £20 a week in social security support would prevent millions of families from having to make the choice of paying their bills or feeding their children. Will the Prime Minister now immediately uplift the child element of universal credit and child tax credit by £20 per week? Mr Speaker, this is a government that has done everything that we possibly can uh, so far to help families in need, to make sure that nobody is penalised for doing the right thing uh, during the crisis, because I know how difficult it has been. That's why uh, we uprated the universal credit by £1,044, benefiting, uh, I think, 4 million families uh, in this country. But I, I say in all sincerity to the right honourable gentleman uh, that we, we are fully aware that there will be tough times ahead and we do stand by to do more where we can. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. £20 a week. £20 a week to help families with children. That's what we are asking for. We're talking about an extra £20 a week to stop families having to make the choice between paying their bills or feeding their children. That's the harsh reality, Prime Minister. This is a question of helping people survive. This Tory government has seen a decade of austerity that has driven people into poverty, that has scrapped child poverty targets. Rather than reversing the damaging policies that have pushed millions into poverty, the Prime Minister is more interested in finding money to spend on his own vanity project, a luxury VIP plane. Is he seriously saying that he won't find £20 a week to help families who are struggling to survive. Uh, no, of course not, Mr Speaker, and that's why we're investing massively in universal credit, in uh, employment support allowance, in uh, benefits across the board, to say nothing of the novel uh, schemes that we have introduced, such as a coronavirus job retention scheme, which is, by, is a model uh, for, that I think the whole world is admiring. There's no other country that has put its arms around 11 million workers in the way that this government has supported jobs, supported incomes across the whole of the UK. We're going to get this country through it, and I hope he supports our measures. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, this morning, with the Social Market Foundation, I published my report titled Unlock Britain, which sets out reforms, ten reforms that the government can put in place to help our economy recover once the health crisis is behind us. Would the Prime Minister agree to work with me and consider some of these ideas, in particular my idea of a recovery fund for British small and medium-sized businesses, indeed small and medium-sized businesses from the entire United Kingdom, to help reduce their debt burden and give them equity so they can power our recovery forward? I, I've studied my honourable friend's uh, proposals with interest, and he is an expert in uh, what he speaks of. And uh, we will certainly look at all kinds of ways, imaginative ways, in which we can stimulate a, a strong rebound, a strong economic recovery. And uh, he should stand by uh, for what the Chancellor is going to be announcing in the next few weeks. Sir Edward Davy. Mr. Speaker, due to the COVID crisis, tens of thousands of British businesses face bankruptcy. Millions of British people face redundancy. So in Britain's hour of need, will the Prime Minister put the practical imperative of saving jobs before his Brexit ideology, rather than risking a bad deal or a no deal due to the deadline set before coronavirus? Why doesn't the Prime Minister show some good old-fashioned British common sense, give our economy the chance to breathe and accept the EU's offer of a delay? Well, uh, I, I, I just put it to the uh, right honourable uh, gentleman that there is another way of, of looking at it. And the, well, the first point, I think the people in this country are heartily sick of going on about Brexit. And they want to get it done. And, uh, uh, they, we got it done. Uh, we want it, we're going to move forward. So, the other point is, when, when we come to the end of the transition period, we will be able, Mr Speaker, to do things differently. We will be able to respond to our economic needs in a creative and constructive way, uh, uh, looking at regulation, looking at uh, uh, 
at, uh, at uh, ways in which we support industries in a way that we haven't been able to do before. That will be very productive for this country. Let's not delay that moment. Let's get on with it. Jeffrey yeah. Clifton Brown. Mr Speaker, I'm sure everybody will be delighted that my right honourable friend is back in this house in such robust form. Yeah. Yeah. He will be pleased to know that almost 50% of the children in Gloucestershire who qualify are back at schools now, but their education has suffered over the last few months. Would he consider, therefore, doing two things? Firstly, to ask all teachers to set all their children and pupils a, a catch-up plan before the summer. And secondly, would he ask all head teachers to get a recovery plan so that everybody can go back in September? Uh, yes, indeed, Mr. Speaker, and that's the, uh, absolutely crucial that we do that. There's a big catch up plan that uh, uh, my right honourable friend, the uh, Education Secretary, is going to be announcing uh, very shortly. It's vital that uh, kids uh, get the catch up on the education that they have lost, but even more vital, as I think I may have mentioned to the House already this morning, uh, that the kids who can go to school should go to school. And wouldn't it be a fine thing, uh, Mr. Speaker? Speaker, if we heard from all sides of the House that schools are safe to go to, rather than the wibble wobble uh, that we've heard from the opposition this morning. Heading to South Wales with Jessica Morton. Jessica Morton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A strong UK steel industry is essential for the UK's economic recovery. Plants like Lamwern and the Orb Steelworks in Newport, the only electrical steel plant in the UK, can play a key part in that recovery. But three months into this crisis, and steel companies are still waiting for government liquidity support, it's critical. Will the Prime Minister commit to address this now? Uh, well, I, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady because uh, we take this uh, issue in the UK steel uh, industry very, very seriously. We're doing everything we can to maintain uh, UK steel production, though clearly it was always facing difficulties even before uh, Corona struck. I, I will make sure that I look at the particular needs of the, of the concern that uh, uh, she raises in, in, in Newport East, and we will uh, ensure that we do everything uh, we can. I just remind her that we've supported 9,200 workers uh, in her constituency through the furlough scheme. Salone Saxby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Coronavirus has underlined the importance of improving broadband infrastructure. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that extending the existing relief on business rates for new full fibre infrastructure could see the release of the investment we need to level up rural areas like North Devon? And will he thank telecommunication workers for their efforts during the pandemic? Yeah. Absolutely right, Mr Speaker. And, uh, that's why we've provided 100% uh, business rate relief for all new fibre investment. And I, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in thanking the uh, amazing work of the telecommunications workers who have kept uh, going, uh, many of them throughout the pandemic, to put in that uh, broadband infrastructure. I, I thank them uh, with her. Christian Mathis. Mr yeah. Speaker, the Prime Minister has previously stated to the House that he had no correspondence or discussions with the Secretary of State for Housing and Communities about the West Ferry Print Works application. Will he now also confirm that none of his officials or advisers also had such correspondence or discussions with the Secretary of State for Housing and Communities or his officials and advisers? And will the Prime Minister undertake to publish all correspondence relating to this matter when the Cabinet Secretary reports? Oh, um, I'm, I'm grateful to the uh, honourable gentleman. I, can, I, I certainly had no uh, correspondence about this matter with myself, and, and nor as far as I'm aware any of my officials. But uh, uh, if there is anything to be said, I know that uh, I think the right honourable gentleman has written to the Cabinet Secretary, and he will be writing back. Robert Thank you, Mr Speaker. The reopening of non-essential shops in Aylesbury on Monday has been a very welcome boost to restart the local retail sector. Can my right honourable friend assure me he'll do everything necessary to stimulate the rest of the Buckinghamshire economy in the weeks and months to come? For example, easing restrictions on outdoor tables and chairs, cutting unnecessary regulation, and perhaps most importantly, providing a dedicated stimulus for our small businesses, the businesses for which the county is rightly renowned. Yes. Uh, I, I thank him. I thank him for the way he campaigns for business in, uh, in Aylesbury, in his, in his constituency. What we will be doing is, uh, is obviously uh, doing what we can uh, to uh, flex the social distancing rules, but only as we make 
progress in driving the incidence of the, the virus down. I think everybody understands the tension uh, that the whole country I- is operating, the, 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 the trade-off that we have to operate. We must continue to defeat uh, that virus, but we are sticking to our plan. We, we will stick ruthlessly to our plan uh, to continue uh, with uh, opening of uh, hospitality sectors uh, on uh, July the 4th at the earliest and proceed on that basis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, in response to a question from the member from Lewisham Deptford, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, newly shielded people may be asking themselves whether they'll be entitled to furlough funds. I have been made aware of the issue very recently and I can assure her that we'll be addressing it forthwith. But since then, the de- deadline for applying for the furlough scheme has been and gone, and there's been no announcement about the support for shielding workers. So could I ask the Prime Minister, is this yet another U-turn, or has the Prime Minister just forgotten what he said in the chamber last week? No. Uh, no, Mr Speaker, the furlough scheme should be available for everybody. We go to the gallant gentleman, Bob Stewart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's really good to see the Prime Minister looking fighting fit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I ask my right honourable friend where we are in in the process of trying to stop repeated vexatious claims against servicemen and servicewomen who have been involved in fatality shootings in the Northern Ireland campaign? Yes, Uh, I I, I thank my right honourable friend and he's, he's absolutely right and uh, we are going to be bringing forward legislation that uh, focuses on protecting uh, people who have been involved, whether victims or veterans uh, alike, uh, ensuring equal treatment uh, in, uh, in Northern Ireland for, for our veterans and also for those who have served overseas. Jim Timms. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A, a million people with no recourse to public funds can't access the universal credit safety net. I agree with the Prime Minister's point at the Liaison Committee that hard-working families in that position should have help of one kind or another. So will he deliver help? Will he suspend the no recourse to public funds restriction for the duration of this crisis and do it before the school summer holidays so that destitute families can at least claim the free school meal vouchers he announced yesterday? Um, well, Mr Speaker, I, 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 of course they should be eligible for, for those, but they're already those, under no, no, who, those who have no recourse to uh, public funds uh, do have access, as I've said to him repeatedly uh, in this chamber, to coronavirus job retention scheme, self-employment uh, income support scheme, uh, the measures that we've introduced to protect uh, renters, the mortgage holiday uh, for those who need it, and uh, when an individual has been working for long enough in the UK and enough national insurance contributions have been made, they may also be entitled to uh, employment uh, and support allowance. And, and, there are, and so, uh, it is, although no recourse to public funds sounds as though uh, it means there is there are just that, it is a term of art. There are many ways in which we support. We support the poorest and neediest in this country. We're proud to do so, and we will continue to do so. Jeremy Wright. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I welcome efforts by companies like Facebook to make the internet a safer and less misleading place? But I know my right honourable friend will agree that we cannot leave online platforms to regulate themselves. So can I urge him to allow no further delay in the bringing forward of the government's response to the online harms white paper consultation and legislation which will enable this country to play the global leadership role on this it can and should play? Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, Mr Speaker, and I know that he's campaigned on this issue, and I remember the interest that he's taken on, uh, in online harms. They're, they're, they're an evil. Uh, they have been, there is a real risk uh, during the lockdown that they have been, terrible things have been going on behind uh, closed doors, closed curtains in this, uh, in this country on the internet. Uh, we had a summit on the matter in, uh, in, in uh, Number 10 recently, and we are working at pace uh, as, as he knows, on new legislation against online harms. Brown. Here, here. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As if BA's behaviour hasn't been bad enough, an agency in their supply chain short term did not pay staff during COVID, claiming they were waiting clarifications from HMRC about furlough. The workers then couldn't access benefits and have now been made redundant after 10 weeks of zero income. Will the ensure HMRC clarifies matters and considers an extension to furlough deadline but also if short-term are found to be bluffing, what's he going to do to stop companies 
treating workers like numbers in a spreadsheet. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I am concerned about the behaviour of some uh, companies, and I think that many colleagues around the House would have received uh, similar uh, representations from their own uh, constituents. I don't want to single uh, any out, but it is very important uh, that companies recognise the government, the, the taxpayer, has gone to huge lengths uh, to help to put our arms around UK business. Uh, they should do what they can as well uh, to look after their workers in very difficult times, because those workers will stand them in good stead uh, when uh, the economy turns up again. Jonathan Gullis. Mr Speaker, in Stoke-on-Trent, North, Kidsgrove and Talk, I have the incredible Chatley Whitfield colliery. Once the beating heart of the Industrial Revolution, Chatley is now sadly at risk of being lost. Will my right honourable friend support me, Stoke-on-Trent City Council, Historic England and the friends of Chatley Whitfield to protect and preserve this historic landmark by creating an industrial heritage park to stimulate tourism, create new green jobs and memorialise the history from the pits to the pots? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I congratulate uh, my honourable friend and the friends of, of Chatterley Whitfield uh, Colliery for the ambition uh, uh, that uh, he has just outlined for a, a heritage park. Uh, I think it is a proposal that he needs to, to work up in more detail and uh, bring to the Government. We will certainly look at it uh, with interest. 25 has been withdrawn by Amy Callaghan. I am sure all the House pass on our best wishes and looking forward to a speedy recovery and the return to the House. Yeah. We now come to Julie Marson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that as our country emerges from this crisis, we have an opportunity to be bold in putting innovation at the centre of our response, to support high growth sectors such as green energy and fintech, and also to use innovative financial solutions such as social impact bonds as a tool in delivering our levelling up agenda? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker. She may not believe it, but uh, when I was uh, Mayor of London, we pioneered social impact bonds to, uh, to, study, uh, to, to, to tackle uh, the most entrenched uh, rough sleepers, to, get, to give uh, value to companies for their success in dealing with, uh, with this, this terrible uh, problem and, and to charities. And uh, I'm proud to say that, that those social impact bond schemes are now being used in seven projects across the country to tackle rough sleeping. We've made huge progress in dealing with rough sleeping. It's a scar. The number of rough sleepers has been a scar, Mr Speaker, on uh, our consciences. Uh, it has got much, much better in, uh, over the crisis, but we must make sure it does not recur. Forgive me, Mr Speaker. No problem. Final question. Knowledge to come, Michael. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Beef farmers in my constituency produce a high-quality product in which consumers can have confidence because our farmers can demonstrate lifelong traceability of their cattle. Their efforts, however, are undermined by labelling legislation in this country, which allows beef from anywhere in the world to be labelled as British beef as long as it is packaged in this country. If the Prime Minister is serious about maintaining food standards, especially in light of any future trade arrangements, will he do something to close that loophole? Uh, well, yes, Mr Speaker, and if, if, the, if what the Right Honourable Gentleman says is indeed the case, and I'm sure uh, that he, he knows exactly whereof he, he speaks, it, I, I can only say that it must be one of those things that is currently governed uh, by the laws of the EU, uh, which, uh, uh, to, to which he is bound to, to return an independent Scotland, uh, should that catastrophe ever arise. And, uh, Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House uh, intend to take advantage of the freedoms uh, that that we, have, that we have won, and that the freedoms that the British people have decided to take back to make sure that Scottish beef farmers do have the protections that they need. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safer arrival of those participating in the next time, suspending the House for three minutes. Point of order, come after me.